Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up this week, a new warning that e-cigarettes may not be as safe as they seem. The New England Journal of Medicine says e-cigarette users are 5 to 15 times more likely than long-term smokers to get formaldehyde-related cancers. Holly, first of all, what exactly is formaldehyde and what is this study saying Hi, exactly? Anthony. Well, formaldehyde is a chemical. It's found in a number of things ranging from fabrics to glue. And importantly, it's inhaled when we smoke regular tobacco cigarettes. Uh, and it's linked with cancers ranging from leukemia to cancers of the nose and pharynx. Uh, so researchers wanted to know if e-cigarettes also expose users to formaldehyde. So they took a, a, an e-cigarette in the lab. It was a high power e-cigarette called a tank system mm -hmm. and they created a vapor and then studied that vapor. What they found was that at a low voltage, there was no formaldehyde exposure. But if you heated the e-cigarette up to one of the higher voltages, five volts specifically, there was almost two and a half times the amount of formaldehyde that a, a, you would be exposed to if you smoked a regular cigarette. So it was a lot. Well, Holly, the American Vaping Association says that this study is flawed. Why? You know, this study had a lot of critics, uh, basically because what they're saying is what happens in the lab doesn't necessarily pertain to real life. Uh, if you smoke an e-cigarette at such a high voltage, they say it will taste terrible. You'll just get a burned taste. You know, nobody will really enjoy it. So users aren't likely to do it that way. Uh, still, I think it's important to know that there is the potential for exposure to formaldehyde. John, we've been talking about this for a while on oh, this okay. show, uh, about e-cigarettes and this marketing that they're safer, but there really haven't been any studies. Does, is this changing that? Anthony, we have no idea what the long-term safety of these e-cigarettes is. I mean, after all, you're taking a liquid and you're heating it up, you're sucking the vapor into your lungs. It's not FDA regulated. We don't know exactly what chemicals we are inhaling into our lungs. And do you really want to do that? Or do you want to have the FDA more involved and in looking at it and doing some studies? The FDA is, uh, is very, very vehement that they want to get more regulatory capacity here. And I think we're going to see that in, in the not too distant future. Well, our next story marks a milestone in medical research. Every five seconds, someone in America suffers a traumatic brain injury, and one third of those cases will be severe enough to cause a coma. Doctors often tell families to constantly talk to their loved ones, even when they're unconscious. But the question always remained, can they hear me? Ben Tracy shows us how, for the first time, science may have an answer. <laughs> Four years ago, Godfrey Katniss was a new dad and an inspirational youth pastor in Orange County, California. It has to be devotion to God when things are going badly. Then a brain hemorrhage left him in a medically induced coma. Doctors told his wife Corinth he may never wake up. It's devastating. This is the person that I love most in the, this world. Just completely devastated. But Corinth never lost hope. She talked to her husband constantly. What would you say? Just prayed, read to him, told him how his daughter was doing. After three months, Godfrey woke up. He could not speak or walk, but his mind still worked. Neuroscientist Teresa Pape worked on the coma study at Northwestern Medicine and Heinz VA Hospital in Chicago. Researchers performed brain scans on 15 coma patients. When they heard unfamiliar voices, the scan showed little activity. But when they heard familiar voices saying their names or talking, the scans lit up. Something as simple as telling stories can help heal. Pape's team also asked the families to record themselves talking about familiar experiences. Eight of the patients, including Godfrey Katniss, were given headphones. His wife talked about their wedding day. The other seven were only played silence. All eight who heard stories had quicker recoveries. Bottom line is, is this is showing that we can do something with the brain and we can facilitate repair. He preached from Hebrew 6. Godfrey now writes devotionals for his church with his iPad, which also helps him communicate. Do you remember hearing these stories while you were in the coma? Mm -hmm. Yes. What did it mean to you to hear those voices? I thought it was kind of comforting to think that they were there with me. It was comforting that they were there with you. Comforting also to loved ones who now know that science has answered their question. In many cases, they can, in fact, hear you. Ben Tracy, CBS News, Irvine, California.
It's amazing. John, I wonder what exactly is happening in the brain when patients hear familiar voices? Well, the MRI studies show that you light up language centers and you light up areas throughout the brain. And the thinking is you may be priming the brain for subsequent stimulus, like kick-starting it. Because we used to think that you couldn't repair the brain, but now we know the brain can actually repair itself. It can rewire itself, and this may be a way of getting things going. Holly, what does this research mean both for patients and for families? I mean, I, I think it's incredible. Not only will it help patients get better, faster, uh, but it does so much for families. This gives families a, a sense of control, a sense that they can really help their loved one, help, rather help their loved one just by, just by talking. So it's going to make a big difference. And we should say that this is a, a very small study. Eight people got the, right. the treatment. It's a specific type of a coma caused by traumatic brain injury. So it's not all comas for all people. Okay. People often say, are you sitting down before they give bad news? But you may want to stand up when you see this. A new study says people who sit too much every day have an increased risk of serious illness. John, what illnesses are you at more, more at risk for if you sit down a lot? Heart disease, yeah. cancer, diabetes, early death. <laughs> The so, worst stuff. <laughs> all, all the worst stuff. Uh, as bad as you can stuff. get. As ba about laundry as bad lists. as you can get. But yeah, then so how much like... sitting is too much sitting? I spoke to Dr. David Alter, who is one of the lead authors for this, and he, he was so interesting. He said, four hours and less, um, you don't really see a big effect, but over four hours of sitting, you start to see an increase in the risk of these things. And as you get to eight or nine hours of just mm -hmm. sitting around in a 12-hour waking day, in a 12-hour period, then you, you start to really... Increase. So if you start a regular exercise program, can you erase the effects of that? Well, this is so interesting, Anthony. So normally, the increased risk of all these different things we mentioned is about 15 to 20 percent increased risk. Mm -hmm. If you do no exercise whatsoever, so the double whammy of you're just sitting around and you're a lox and you're not doing any exercise at all ever, <laughs> then it goes up to 40 percent. Right. If you do exercise, it goes down to 10 percent increased risk, but not down to zero. Right. So during the day, you have to start to do something. Yeah. Well, next, new evidence about the medical benefits of having a partner. British researchers find people are more than twice as likely to stop smoking, exercise more, and lose weight if their significant other does the same. So, Holly, tell us more about this study. Right. Well, British researchers, they looked at nearly 4,000 couples, people who are either married or living together, and they focused on three specific health goals. They were quitting smoking, losing 5% of your body weight, mm -hmm. and increasing your physical activity. And not surprisingly, they found if one partner did those things, the other was more likely to. But it was, they were dramatic dramatically more likely to. For instance, if one partner quit smoking, the other was six times as likely to follow suit. Well, what if your partner is already fit and healthy? What is the effect there? You know, Elaine, I think to me this was the most interesting aspect of the study. Change seemed to be more influential than consistency, especially when it comes to weight loss. So if both partners are overweight and one loses weight, the other is much more likely to follow and, and lose weight. If one partner's overweight and the other has always been a normal weight, it didn't seem to make much difference. It didn't help the other person lose. Oh, so it was the change that really motivated it. All right, Dr. John LaPook, Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you both very much.